Hello, my name is Peter McCarthy. I oversee NBT Bank's interest rate swap program, and I'm part of a team that we put together a few years ago here at the bank uh, to work on transitioning the bank and our customers away from LIBOR. In this video, I'd like to provide a brief outline of why LIBOR is going away, and I'd also like to discuss uh, SOFR, which is emerging as the most likely replacement for floating rate financial contracts that previously would have been priced off a of LIBOR index. LIBOR stands for the London Interbank Offered Rate. When LIBOR was developed, it was a measure of the rate of interest that certain banks in the UK, what are called panel banks, would charge to make unsecured loans to each other. Over the years, the use of LIBOR expanded greatly. And currently, throughout the world, there's hundreds of trillions of dollars of financial contracts that are indexed to LIBOR. After the financial crisis of 2008-2009, uh, the panel of banks that submitted LIBOR transaction information became less and less willing to make unsecured loans to one another. As a result, there have become far fewer interbank loans underpinning the index. Therefore, now LIBOR is based on a very thin volume of actual transactions. Because of the reduced volumes, the banks that provide LIBOR submissions now often submit rate uh, data based only on their expert judgment, essentially what they think they could charge to make unsecured loans to one another rather than on actual transactions. Not only has the number of actual transactions underpinning LIBOR fallen significantly, but certain of the banks that were provide, providing LIBOR submissions were intentionally misstating the information that they were providing in order to manipulate uh, derivative markets in a way that would favor them. Uh, finally, in 2017, as confidence in the reliability of LIBOR dwindled, the UK's Financial Conduct Authority, commonly called the FCA, uh, announced that it would, it would stop requiring panel banks to submit LIBOR data, which effectively meant that LIBOR would, would no longer exist. Initially, uh, all LIBOR indices were to cease being published at the end of this year, at the end of 2021. And while that holds true for certain LIBOR tenors, one-month LIBOR and three-month LIBOR, which are the two, two tenors that NBT uses, are now expected to continue to be published until June 30th of 2023. So for obvious reasons, all uh, LIBOR-based financial transactions that extend beyond that date in 2023 must contain provisions allowing for a replacement index to be implemented when LIBOR ceases to be published. Also, because of the inherent differences between LIBOR and any replacement index, financial contracts must include a mechanism to adjust the rate spread over or under the replacement index in order for the contract parties to receive similar economic value to that they were receiving under LIBOR. While many existing LIBOR-based uh, loans can continue, uh, to use LIBOR until June of 2023. Uh, bank regulators in the U.S. Uh, have announced that banks may no longer originate new LIBOR-based contracts be beyond the end of 2021. Um, even before the FCA announced that it would sunset LIBOR, um, as, as seeing that confidence in LIBOR was waning, in 2014, um, the, the Federal Reserve Board and the New York Fed formed something called the Alternative Reference Rate Committee, commonly known as ARC, to begin to study alternatives to LIBOR. Uh, ARC is made up of a broad group of entities, including banks, regulators, investment groups, Fannie Mae, ISDA, the National Association of Corporate Treasurers, and others. Uh, there's, a, there's a plethora of information available on the internet if anybody would like to learn more about ARC and, and, and read more about um, the work that they've done. Their goal, as I said, was to, to develop a replacement for LIBOR and also to ensure a smooth transition away from, um, from the use of LIBOR. They set out to develop uh, a replacement for LIBOR that would be supported by broad and, a broad and deep market, uh, one that's based on observable transactions uh, and therefore would be all but impossible to manipulate. To meet these objectives, ARC developed a secured overnight financing rate, which is commonly called, commonly referred to as SOFR. SOFR is based on overnight transactions in the U.S. Treasury repurchase market. It's published 
every business day on the Federal Reserve Bank of New York website. Um, it's important to know that there are differences between LIBOR and SOFR. Um, for example, SOFR rates are based on previous activity. Uh, so these are essentially historic in nature versus LIBOR rates, which are prospective, in that they're based on expectations about future rate movement. SOFR transactions are backed by U.S. Treasury repos and therefore are considered risk-free, unlike LIBOR, which is based on unsecured transactions and includes bank credit risk. Because of the inherent differences between LIBOR and SOFR, the interest rate spreads uh, that a customer would expect to see with LIBOR are going to be different than those that they would uh, see with SOFR. For loan contracts that extend beyond LIBOR's end date and then transition to SOFR, the interest rate spread over SOFR will need to widen as compared to the spread over LIBOR in order for the contract parties to receive similar economic value. These spread adjustments between LIBOR and SOFR have been calculated by a third party, by Bloomberg, and Bloomberg pu publishes um, these spread differences with various tenors. As I said, SOFR is just an overnight rate. It's based on overnight activity, whereas most tenors of LIBOR are for longer terms, such as one month LIBOR and three month LIBOR. Uh, there are different indices that have been developed using SOFR averages, including the ones that I've listed here. The first one, which we've started using at MBT, the New York Fed 30 day average SOFR index, um, is calculated from a 30 day compound of uh, compound average, should say, of SOFR rate settings. Um, it's interesting to note that with this index, although it's calculated from historic information, this index is set in advance of the accrual period, just as LIBOR is today. The next two indices that I've listed are also based on SOFR averages. One is based on a simple average and the other a compound average. However, unlike the New York Fed 30-day average index, these two are based on averages calculated near the end of the accrual period and serviced in arrears, which means that rate settings using this and these indices are determined near the end of the accrual period rather than at the beginning, which allows interest to accrue based on SOFR settings throughout the accrual period rather than based on averages uh, which occurred prior to the accrual period. A term SOFR index or a forward-looking SOFR index has also been developed and was, was recently endorsed by ARC. Uh, it's based on expectations about future uh, interest rates, just like LIBOR. Um, this this uh, index may be attractive in certain uh, contracts, certain situations, because it works much like LIBOR, but it may not be appropriate uh, for use in all situations. Well, I'm not going to spend much time on them. I did want to mention that there were other floating rate indices that have been gaining uh, various levels of market traction. Um, I, I included Prime in this list uh, as it continues to be an option for floating rate borrowings, but certainly Prime isn't new. Uh, banks have been, been lending using Prime for years and certainly will continue to do so. We will certainly continue to do so. Uh, two of the uh, newer indices that you may have been hearing about include Ameribor and Bisbee, which is an acronym for the Bloomberg Short-Term Bank Yield Index. Uh, Ameribor reflects the actual unsecured borrowing costs of certain banks uh, in the U.S., similar to LIBOR, but based on U.S. rather than U.K. banks. Bisbee indices are based on average yields at which large banks uh, obtain unsecured wholesale funding. Uh, they're based on real transactions, observable transactions, and don't rely on submissions from banks. At NBT, uh, we expect the markets will evolve as banks start lending uh, on, on non-LIBOR indices. And while SOFR-based indices should continue to garner a lot of traction in the financial markets, other non-SOFR indices may also end up receiving strong acceptance and, and may see wide use. Uh, at NBT, we fully intend to continue to offer our commercial borrowers financing options based on all widely accepted rate indices. The last thing that I'd like to touch on is the impact the LIBOR transition will have on interest rate swap market. We've asked all of our interest rate swap customers to adhere to the ISDA 2020 LIBOR fallback protocol and to work with us to make sure that their NBT loan documentation includes provisions to deal with LIBOR's elimination. For customers that have adhered to the protocol, 
and whose loan documentation contains the appropriate provisions. When LIBOR is no longer available, now scheduled for 2023, the interest on the floating rate leg of their swap will convert to an index based on compound average SOFR, including a spread adjustment. And the interest on their floating rate loan will convert to the same index with the same spread adjustment. So as a result, the interest on their floating rate loan will continue to be offset by the interest on the floating rate leg of the swap and customers will continue to enjoy the same fixed swap rate that they did prior to LIBOR's elimination. Thank you for taking the time to view this presentation. I hope that you found the information that I've provided to be helpful to you. If you have any questions about anything I've discussed, uh, I encourage you to reach out to your NBT Bank Relationship Manager for further information. Again, thank you.